at home and looking for things to do. It is so easy. You are never going to roll up the, your sheets or your fitted sheets in a ball again. The width of the brush is actually the width that your brow should be. From the Zoomerplex in historic Liberty Village, The Zoomer with Marissa Lennox. Welcome to The Zoomer. Sometimes it takes thinking outside of the box to make things a little bit easier. On today's show, life hacks from experts who found better ways to do the things we do almost every day, like removing tomato sauce stains, folding fitted sheets, or even applying eyeliner. But before we dive in, let's tee up the topic. The term life hack was coined in 2004. Defined as a perfect shortcut, little wonder there's a whole industry built around it. One popular life hack site attracts more than 20 million readers per month. And books on the topic have sold millions of copies worldwide. From helping us achieve inbox zero to cooking a healthy meal in 20 minutes or less, there's no shortage of tips and tricks to make our daily lives a bit easier. Like removing highlighter stains with lemon juice or cutting onions with a wet knife, it'll save your tears. But the ultimate hacks are the ones that save you money, like switching from name brands to store brands. A simple tip that could save more than $1,100 at the grocery store per year. All right, starting us off is lifestyle and parenting expert Sherry French with ideas to up your baking game in the kitchen. Hey, Sherry. Hey. It's so good to have you, and I love your ideas, so let's get started. The first is how to avoid greasy, wet cupcake liners when they come out of the oven. I, for one, have purchased many fancy cupcake liners only to have them come out of the oven looking a little bit like a greasy mess. So how do we avoid that? Never again. So this is a hack actually my 13 year old taught me. So when you when you actually put your normal cupcake holders in, you're right, they're all kind of greasy and wet. Here's a great hack. Go into your pantry, pull out your box of rice, put a little bit into your hand and you're just gonna sprinkle this into the bottom of each of the cupcake holders. Put your paper in, bake and you'll see when they're ready to go, let me pull one here. You'll have the rice that's stuck on the bottom but guess what? It is dry as anything and no grease because that dry rice has sucked up all of that grease. That's brilliant. I, I mean, it's, it's sometimes the, the, the solutions are right there in your pantry. And again, I didn't even know it. <laughs> all right, what's the next one? All right, so this next one, I'll be honest, a lot of recipes when we're baking call for room temperature eggs. Well, guess what? I'm the lady that goes into my fridge, pulls out the cold eggs, and I bake with them but here's a great hack that I'm now using. Put your eggs into a bowl, get your tap water running to lukewarm, and in just five minutes, you will have your eggs ready to bake at room temperature. Who knew? First of all, who knew that your eggs needed to be room temperature before you baked with them? Well, again, the recipes call, but I never paid attention. I use cold ones. <laughs> all right, and then what happens if you do crack an egg and a little bit of that eggshell gets in with the mix? Well, I always get those little pieces in and quite often, I know many people watching stick their finger in trying to chase that little piece around. Or a Never, spoon. Or spoon, anything to get that out, but you can't. Use the big part of the shell that you have left and all you're going to do is scoop out and this actually attracts those little pieces and they're gonna end up in that big part of that broken egg and you'll have perfect baking with no crunchy. I love it, I love it. All right, what's the next one? Okay, so this one I never knew either, and I'll be honest, when I cook or bake with sticky stuff, so peanut butter, your honey, you usually put it in scoop, but then you've gotta get a knife to get all that little excess out. Here's a great hack. Using just cooking spray, or you can even use oil, you're gonna soak your, your spoon in it, put the sticky stuff in, and this will fall right out with leaving just a little bit, you see on the edge here that I didn't have enough oil on, will fall right out and you're not having to scrape anything off. <laughs> you know, that's, I mean, it's brilliant. It's also brilliant. All right, what's the next one? All right, so when you're baking the two layer round cakes, quite often I would spray or I use butter on the bottom, but when I'm flipping it over and put it, putting them on top of each other, quite often they will break and fall apart. Here's a great hack that actually my mom kind of has a version of. So grab some parchment paper. You're gonna have a square, fold it in half, and then fold it into quarters. 
You're then going to fold two triangles. So across kind of like a, like a serviette and then go across again and then turn that same cake pan upside down. And you're going to actually measure this little triangle that you've got, put the center, the point in the center, you're going to use your scissors up here are my scissors. You'll cut around the edge. So you're making a circle. So it comes out looking like this, put this on the bottom of all of your round pen pans. So when you're ready to take that baked cake out of the oven and flip it over, it's going to come right off and you just peel the parchment paper away. Super clean, I love it. Okay, we're short for time, so I want you to walk us through what I was super excited about, which is chocolate-covered strawberries. Oh, yeah. All right, so always making these in our home, but the problem is I can't make them fancy enough. I do use parchment paper, but you set them on their side and they turn out flat. Look like you're working at a candy store. Take some toothpicks from your cupboard, yep. put the strawberries on. You're gonna dip the chocolate into the strawberries. Yep. And then you're going to take a colander. Now the key thing is your colander or your strainer that you have in your cupboard, make sure the holes are small enough, flip it over, okay. and you're then going to put just that toothpick right into that colander. And those strawberries are gonna stand up straight and they won't be flat on any side and they'll look amazing on How's all that? sides of that strawberry. How's that? Woo. Yeah, you gotta push it down, push it down. It should slide right in. Yep. Again, big. you don't wanna have the big holes. There you go. There you go, okay. Now you're not gonna have a flat side, so simple. All right, okay, we've got a couple more. How do we make buttermilk? All right, so I have never purchased buttermilk in my life. I'm assuming it's in the milk section, but my mom taught me this hack. So when you're making pancakes, every Sunday morning I'm making my own buttermilk, you need a cup of milk. Got it. And then you can do a tablespoon of white vinegar or do a shot as I always do. You a can shot. cheat. Okay. And then put that into a mixing bowl and then grab your whisk and you're gonna whisk it up. And like I said, I use this every Sunday in my pancakes. They are the fluffiest ever. And then I also make homemade chicken fingers and I soak the chicken in this for about six hours. Cause again, it's buttermilk, never buy it again. I just learned you could make chicken wings with buttermilk and that apparently it's brilliant. And that's it, and there you go. it's as simple as that's that. That's it, it's so simple. And honestly, like I said, my mom taught me this from again, living at home, I've never bought buttermilk in my life. <laughs> All right, Sherry, before I let you go, I have to ask, because I've seen you do it, you have to show our audience how to fold a fitted sheet. Unrelated to baking, but we gotta do it. <laughs> yeah, so this was something. Fridays at my house in Oshawa, we were always stripping the bed, and then we'd come home and mom would have the fitted sheets folded like a flat sheet. So I have mastered her trick. So <laughs> let me show you. It is so easy. You are never going to roll up the, your sheets or your fitted sheets in a ball again. So first things we got to do is turn it inside out. So I've got my left hand in the one corner. I've got my right hand in the other and it's inside out. You are going to go right hand over left hand, flip, and then pull out this side and you can see I've kind of got one corner ready to go. I'm going to switch hands now. So right hand replaces the left. I'm gonna follow the edge of the sheet and find those other two corners, which is probably, this is the hardest part, trying to find those other two corners. So bear with me here. Now I've got these two hands. I'm gonna go over one more time. And now I'm going to end up basically with a rect rectangle. So I've got this corner and then let me fold this one over. Can you see that? Yep. yep. Rect rectangle, right? Yep. Now you're probably in the bedroom, lay it on your bed, not your kitchen counter. And we're gonna fold it three ways, long ways. So I'll come back to you here. I've just done two folds to, in, into thirds. And the last one, same thing, into thirds. And watch this. Live TV, I folded a fitted sheet like a flat sheet. Nicely done. All thanks to my mom. <laughs> Those are the best. Those are the best hacks to learn from. <laughs> Absolutely. They all right, Sherry. Well. This has been awesome. Thanks so much. Thanks again for having me. <laughs> we need to take a short break. There's more when we return. I'm going to show you this really cool cleaning hack that helps get rid of rust stains on knives.
Welcome back. House cleaning is often a chore that stares us down with mounting pressure, but it doesn't have to be. Joining me now is Melissa Maker with some cleaning hacks for those of us looking to save time, money, and maybe even our sanity. Hey, Melissa. Hi, Marissa. Nice to be here. Great to have you. All right, well, take us through. What's the first one? Well, uh, if you're someone who cooks tomato sauces or curries and you put them into plastic containers afterward, you might notice that the plastic containers become discolored after a while. And I'll tell you why. That's because plastic is porous, so it absorbs. And this can look unsightly and it's frustrating. Have you been there before? I've been there also. Yep, I've been there. Oh, I've been there. Yeah, so um, there has been this little viral thing going around on TikTok where basically what you do is you take a piece of ripped up paper towel, you mm. put it into the container, you add a small squirt of dish soap, it's pretty easy to do, and then you would add some warm water into the container as well. Following that, you would seal your container up and then give it a good quality shake. You can shake out all your feelings for about a minute. And at the end of this, the idea is you remove the paper towels, you dump out the water, and the paper towels will have absorbed a lot of that discoloration and the oil that came off of whatever it is that you put into the plastic container. I'm shaking out my feelings. Yeah, you're doing a really good job. No workout for you today. <laughs> All right, shall we open it? Let's see. Yeah, you, you can, and then you can kind of give it a dump, and then you'll have to, uh, you know, give it a wipe down as well and you'll see that this works. Now, if it doesn't work, Marissa, here's what you can do instead. Um, you can get baking soda and dish soap and just create a paste and leave it overnight. Sometimes these cleaning hacks are great, but there are times where they don't work, so that's your plan B. Actually, it, it has made a huge improvement, and I suspect if I was to take a paper towel, towel to this right now, here, maybe I'll use this. Can I use this? Yeah, yeah, go for it. I bet you a lot of it would come out. Yeah. There you go. There you go. All right, that's a huge improvement. That is for sure. I love it. Nice. Okay, the next one has to do with stainless steel appliances, fingerprints, and I have two young kids. One's a toddler, so you can imagine what my stainless steel appliances look like. Yeah, I have a three-year-old as well, so I know what those small handprints <laughs> look like and how easily they can get onto everything. <laughs> this is a really, uh, this is a two-part hack. Okay. The first part is sort of obvious, but the second part is what they use in appliance showrooms. This is where the life hack really comes in. So you're gonna get yourself a microfiber cloth and some plain white vinegar and just dip the cloth into the vinegar. And on your appliance, we're using small appliances here, you're gonna work in the direction of the grain, which just means when you look at the stainless steel, you're gonna follow the direction that it runs in. So mine, my kettle here is horizontal and then you'll buff that dry. That's gonna get rid of the fingerprints that you do see. And then if you wanna buy some fingerprint insurance, as I like to call it. Get yourself a paper towel, fold it in half. Mm -hmm. And here I've got mineral oil. You are doing a beautiful job there, by the way. Thank you. I can see my reflection in your kettle. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I like to hear. So nice. So when that's done, get yourself some paper towel, fold it in half, and then you're gonna add about a dime size drop of mineral oil or baby oil. Basically you want a non-vegetable oil so it doesn't go rancid. And then you're going to apply the oil in the same direction that you applied the vinegar and you're gonna buff it in. When this is done, it will have created this little uh, invisible coating. You don't want it to feel oily to the touch. The stainless yeah. steel kind of absorbs the oil, but then if you touch it afterward, you'll see no fingerprint. So oh. it gets you that little bit of fingerprint insurance. Give it a try. Fingerprint insurance. And how long does this fingerprint insurance last? Um, it, I mean, I've seen it last a couple of weeks, so really? it is definitely a worthwhile endeavor. Oh yeah. Right? <laughs> I'm gonna go, I'm going home to do this to all of my stainless steel appliances. Nice. <laughs> All right, what's the next one? So let's talk about cutting boards. Um, you know, a lot of folks, they just think cutting boards, you kind of one and done them, that's it. But I know like this is a lovely wood cutting board. I got it for Mother's Day last year. I really like it. So I want to take good, good care of it. 
And wood cutting boards, you can give them what I like to call a bit of a spa treatment to clean them and scrub them. You know, we can't put them in the dishwasher, but we want to get odors and stains off of them. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that you'll need is coarse salt. It's kind of like uh, the salt that you would see on top of those big pretzels. Got it. Right. And then you'll sprinkle that onto the cutting board. And this is kind of like taking your cutting board to the spa for a little scrub. <laughs> then you'll take a lemon. You can use half of a lemon and kind of juice, like just squirt the juice out on the cutting board. Okay. This is going to give you a little bit of acidity. And then you're going to use it as your cleaning tool and kind of use a circular motion to massage the salt in. So the salt is going to help lift dirt to the surface and the lemon juice is going to help clean and deodorize. I just uh, always assumed cutting boards had a life and that, you know, after a certain period of time, you toss them and you go and you buy new ones. So this no, will well, extend I'm, the life a little bit. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because between doing something like this, then you rinse it, you dry it, and then using that same oil, mineral oil that we used on the kettle just now, uh, and applying that regularly once a month, you can actually keep your wood cutting boards lasting for years. This is a great, easy way to maintain them. So uh, wipe this off, and then you said apply oil to it? Yeah, so you'll rinse it, wipe it, pat it dry, and then when it's dry, you would apply, I just kind of do like a little zigzag pattern with my oil. I buff it in the same way we did with our stainless steel. I leave it overnight, and then it's uh, ready to be used for another month. So I do that monthly. And it smells good too. Yeah. Takes away that garlic smell. Definitely. That garlic and onion, two biggest issues on the cutting board. Oh, for sure. Okay, so speaking of cutting boards, if you have rust on your knives, this is a steak knife. I didn't bring my big chef's knife down. But, you know, stainless steel tends to get little rust spots every now and then, especially if you put your knives in the dishwasher, which is a big no-no. If that happens, and you happen to have yourself a nice big potato like this, I'm going to show you this really cool cleaning hack that helps get rid of rust stains on knives. So what you do is you basically take your knife. It is no more difficult than this. And you're just going to slice into that potato. And you're going to leave it like this overnight. What? Now, I know. So I'm going to explain what's going on. Potatoes have in them what's called oxalic acid, which is something that we find in other cleaning products. And it just helps get rid of rust. So this very passive action of just, you know, taking a potato that might be a little old, getting a couple of those, you know, growths coming out of them and you might not want to eat it. You could use it for this knife cleaning trick instead. In the morning, you'll pull it out. You can get yourself a cloth or a non-scratch sponge and just gently scrub away at that rust and it'll come right off. Who knew? Who knew? All right, Melissa, thanks so much. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. When we come back, do-it-yourself projects to simplify your life. That's next. You know, when you can make them yourself, you really can save money and look cuter <laughs> and have some fun along the way because it really is a fun project. Welcome back. If you find yourself holed up at home this weekend, why not dedicate some time to DIY projects? Jennifer Tryon joins me now with simple do-it-yourself tips to make your life a little bit easier. Jennifer, I understand you've seen quite an uptick in interest for your online crafting and DIY classes. Tell me, how has COVID affected your business? Honestly, I mean, we've been talking about crafting. I mean, I talk about it all day, every day, but it's like the world is at home and looking for things to do. And everybody has become more sustainable, more do-it-yourself oriented, less likely to just run out to the store. And you know, it all started with mask making. You know, when you can make them yourself, you really can save money and look cuter <laughs> and have some fun along the way because it really is a fun project. You can break out your sewing machine for it. Or if you don't have a sewing machine, you could do a DIY version. Um, I've got video that shows you how you can do it with just a glue gun uh, because hot glue will totally stick to fabric and you can mold it around your face. And what I love is you can use up scraps of fabric, whatever you might have lying around. And the best hack for mask making is really to take an old men's 
shirt or a woman's shirt, but I find um, men's ones. Um, there's tons of fabric. They don't have darts and pleats and things in them like women sometimes do. 100% uh, cotton is perfect. And you can cut out the squares. They just need to be about uh, nine inches by nine inches. And you can either sew or fold to get that um, little ventilation system. And um, old t-shirts are perfect um, as the side, um, or the loops around your ear if you don't have mask elastic. And again, break out that old sewing machine. Doesn't have to be brand new. You don't have to be a perfect sewer to sew your own mask. First of all, you might want to clear with your husband first before you go through his wardrobe and start <laughs> cutting up one of his shirts. But did you say it's nine inch by nine inch? And then can you show us how would you attach the elastic then? Exactly. So if you're using a glue gun, uh, you can just fold over your fabric or your elastic around the edges and leave two long tails um, coming out the sides here. Or if you're sewing it, you want to sew um, your right sides together. So this would be the inside of your mask. And then this would be the outside of your mask. And when you sew the right sides together, you're going to put the elastic on the inside right here. Okay. And then when you sew that up, leave a little hole. And when you turn it right side out, your elastic won't have any seams. So you definitely want to sew that um, right sides together with your elastic on the inside, which you know, is a little counterintuitive if you're not used yeah. to sewing. So definitely, um, I've got lots of tutorials on YouTube you can follow along. Um, but mask making really did kick off this new season yeah. of DIY and crafting projects. And, you know, we're seeing so many people sewing and paper crafting now. And what's the other thing that you've got to, to walk us through today? Well, for sure. So I'm talking about paper crafting and we've been talking about the pandemic and preserving memories. And so I wanted to show you my COVID-19 journal uh, that I've made out of an old cracker box. So all of this is just plain pattern paper that we've got at the craft store, or maybe you even have a stash of paper if you're already crafty, but you can often get like kits and just print off um, pictures from your home computer. You know, my sister had a baby during the pandemic. We could only go and see the baby through the window. And these are all memories of things that happened in the last year. I you can know, relate. I had a work. baby during the pandemic. And again, yeah. showing the baby through the window. So I can relate to that one. But these are all little cute things that in a decade from now, even though they seem very top of mind at the moment, we'll be glad that we spent a weekend remembering how many bike rides we went on or how many walks we had to take and put a little bit of that um, journaling in. It doesn't have to be fancy type, just write it on a few lines of paper and you know, put it on a little tag and stick it to your photos. Just at, layer up your photos on some beautiful paper like this and it's surprising what you can create at home with what you've got. Can you take us through the steps? How do you get the coils in there? Right, so um, you'll see that I've used um, a homemade punch board and hole punched it and just coiled that right through using um, the punch from We Are Memory Keepers. It's a home-based system. You can buy one online easily. Um, if you don't have like a hole punch, it's gonna put all of those holes in the, um, in the spine of your um, cracker box, which is of course what we used here. But if you just have a regular hole punch, then you could just use three ring binder um, rings that you can get off Amazon and just put even one ring in your book up here or three rings if you want, or use a binder or a photo album. These are the kinds of things that really kind of last a lifetime and will get passed on. So I'm excited, you know, when the pandemic is, is long behind us, hopefully soon, um, you know, this will be the kind of thing we look back and be like, look at all of the masks we made and all of the people I gave them to. It's, it's amazing kind of what you can create out of an old cracker box or a cereal box because you just need a little bit of cardboard cover, cover it with your pretty paper. I've just folded that paper over, put some, you know, nice paper on the inside. Um, as long as you've got some scissors or a paper trimmer, you know, and a little bit of time, which is what we seem to all have right now, um, these are the kind of things that you can be creating at home. And I'd encourage you to, you know, go to jennifertryon.com, my website, if you're looking for step-by-step -step tutorials on how to do this kind of thing, um, because we're always doing online events virtually live so that we can be crafting together. Very cool. Thanks, Jennifer. We need to take a short break. There's more when we return.
even a quarter of a percentage point, like I said, can yeah. really make or break your retirement, right? That means money not in your, your pocket. Welcome back. Are you thinking of ways to get your financial ducks in a row? Kelly Keene, personal finance educator and best-selling author of Talk Money to Me, joins me now with budgeting hacks for Zoomers, ways to boost your accounts without it hurting. Kelly, let's start there then. What's the easiest way to save money? Yeah, the easiest way, Marissa, is to automate, to automate your savings. Figure out how much you can save and just set it and forget it. Now, because of the pandemic, a lot of people were strapped financially, maybe helping out adult children. They stopped those great savings habits. So now is the perfect time to start them up again. And I would also say automate your spending, like especially when it comes to your bills, because missing those minimum payments, missing those, you know, even if it's not a credit card, if it's the, uh, you know, your cell phone or what have you, you don't want to be paying extra fees and you might not realize that some of those things are actually going on your credit report. So if you don't have the time right now, make a note, but start to automate your savings and the things that you know you have to spend on every single month. Okay, what what's next? Okay, what you want to look at with your savings, uh, things that can really rob you of your retirement, rob you of your vacation, rob you of the things that you love to do, and that's investment fees. Mm -hmm. Now, all things remaining equal, this can eat up so much of your money. So if you do not know what your investment fees are, mm -hmm. I dare say you're probably paying too much. This mm -hmm. is really important that you're looking at you know, what you're paying for your investment, what you're paying for advice. And a great analogy is, you know, if you're going to take your car in and get your transmission replaced, there's also the service fee for that transmission. The same thing occurs with your investments. There's the actual cost of the investment and then the servicing. So you really want to know all those fees because even a quarter of a percentage point, like I said, can yeah. really make or break your retirement, right? That means money not in your, your pocket. Well, and a lot of people don't realize the fees on, say, mutual funds are that much higher than fees on, say, ETFs. So where can someone go to find out that information? Is it on their statement? Is it easily able to be accessed? Can you speak to your financial advisor? What do you suggest? If you're dealing with a professional and you don't know your fees, I think that's a bit of a red flag. Mm -hmm. Get on the phone and talk to them. Like, why are you not aware of it? This should be a conversation every single year. It should not be a surprise when you're selling your investments or buying. And then, yes, if you're doing robo-advising, meaning it's not a robot, <laughs> but you're doing it online, uh, you wanna dig into that as well. And you can just click in and see what the actual fees are while you're doing that. Also important to know what your investments are in, mm -hmm. what your risk tolerance is. You know, as we see the markets do a lot of ups and downs, uh, this is not the time. If you're doing belly flips, then maybe you really need to examine what you're invested in uh, and, and make that time to, to look at it. Speaking of risk tolerance, how do we know? Well, there's the numbers and then there's what I call the tummy factor. So whether it's, you know, online robo advising or with a professional, they are going to walk you through a series of questions. What kinds of ups and downs can you handle? What is your level of sophistication? Because when the markets are doing well, you see the cryptocurrency going up or commodities or what have you, we think that we can handle that. But the reality is if you're not going to sleep at night, and you may actually sell those investments at a loss, it's not worth getting in at all. Mm -hmm. So if you're not sleeping well at night, you're feeling uncomfortable about the volatility, the ups and downs, this is a great time to talk to a pro or dig into what you're invested in. Now, speaking about investments, most of us have an RSP at a certain age. You can, you can begin to draw down on that RSP. What do you suggest for people looking to cash out on some of their retirement savings? Yeah, Marissa, especially for Zoomers, um, you know, you're very aware of OAS and the clawback, old age security, and that, you know, when you have to convert your RSP to a RIF, it starts to force out a minimum payment. Mm -hmm. And that minimum payment keeps going up. And what that means is if you have a pension, if your spouse has income, 
you may be clawed back from OAS, you know, money that you worked so hard to earn. So if there's a way to avoid that, you definitely want to pay attention. I will say a big part of CARB's advocacy is advocating for the elimination of mandatory RIF withdrawals because so many CARP members have told us that they are concerned about outliving their savings. And when you're forced to draw down on those savings, you risk outliving them. So that's a big one. Um, all right, walk us through the next one. It has to do with fraud. Two really important hacks, especially for the Zoomer audience, because maybe you're not checking your credit. You're not you know, needing a mortgage or a car loan or things of that sort. It's so important that you do, though, because that can be a tip off that fraudsters are, uh, you know, trying to steal your identity. So yeah. I think the best way to check your credit report is go to your bank app. Right now, most banks are offering uh, for you to check your score and or your report. What you'll want to look for is anything on there that you haven't signed up for that looks a little bit strange or odd. And then the other hack is to put a proactive fraud alert on both of your credit bureaus, which is Equifax and TransUnion in Canada. That way, if somebody tries to apply for credit in your name, you will be contacted. Uh, they cost $5 with both of the credit bureaus and they last six years. I think it's definitely cheap insurance. Now, when you check your credit, it doesn't affect your rating. Is that right? Very great point. Does nothing for your score exactly. Does not hurt, does not help it. There's so many myths going around there. You can check it every single day if you like, but it is important to keep on top of it. All right, and lastly, a couple tips to getting our affairs in order. Yeah, not the most fun topic, I know, but you are going to save your loved ones so much grief. It's a hard enough time if something happens uh, to an individual, if they're in the hospital or they pass away getting yourself organized. It's, it's essential. And I have to tell you, when I was in the financial industry, I can't tell you how many people would call because they maybe had a business card and they didn't know if their family member had investments or mm -hmm. a life insurance policy. They were just left on their own to figure it out. So today is a great day to start your estate binder. All you're going to do is get a simple binder, get a file folder, you name it, and, and, and start to log what you have, especially, um, you know, with so many people banking online, you know, when you pass away, your loved ones may not even see a statement coming in the mail. They may have no clue what you have. So it's so important that you're writing these things down. If you've got a safety deposit box, if you have a will, where it is, all this type of stuff, it sounds like it's a lot, but it really shouldn't take you more than you know, 10 minutes a day over about a week to log these details down. It's going to save your loved ones so much grief in such a difficult time. Such a good point. All right, Kelly, thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Marissa. There's more after the break, stay tuned. The width of the brush is actually the width that your brow should be. Welcome back. Makeup is an art and a form of self-expression. There's no right way or wrong way to do it, but there are plenty of different techniques out there. Genya Hulak, my beloved Zoomer colleague extraordinaire, joins me now with makeup hacks to enhance your beauty routine. Genya, it's so great to have you in studio. Oh. I can't remember the last time I had someone in studio. Obviously, we're maintaining a good social distance. Um, so let me start with, what's the number one issue Zoomers tell you about when it comes to doing their own makeup? Okay, the number one issue, and a lot of them don't want to do their makeup because they can't see what they're doing. So the first thing I'm telling you is to buy yourself a lovely mirror with lights. On one side is a regular mirror, and on the other side is 15, 10 times. And you can buy this at any one local, Anywhere. local drugstore? Everybody's got them. Everybody's got them. I will say, my eyesight is so bad, and when I finally got glasses for the first time, I put them on and realized my makeup was awful. I mean, terrible. I felt like I hadn't even seen for the first time. Like, I was like, well, I've been doing my makeup in the dark, clearly. So these things can make a huge improvement to, totally, your, to totally. your makeup regime. All right. So the next one is how to perfect a brow. Okay. So there are various ways you could do it. The easiest way to do it is to get, it's a mascara basically for your eyebrows. Looks like a mascara, it's much smaller, and all you do with it is you just 
brush it through your eyebrow hairs and it darkens the actual hair, but it doesn't shape okay. your brow. And it's very difficult to shape a brow. How do you yes. make it even? So for that, I go to my trusted little high-end uh, makeup brand and you get a little brow brush like this. It is made of plastic and you go into your powder. I don't know if you want me to hold this up so everyone can see. And the width of the brush is actually the width that your brow should be. So if I can demonstrate in the mirror on myself, you just place it at the corner of your brow and you brush it in the direction of your brow and that is the width that it should be. Then you take the edge of the brush, dip it back into the powder to create the ends of your brow at the very, very end going down. That's very, it's very simple. Very cool. Very, very simple. Now making our way down the face, one of the most difficult things for me to do for sure is liner. Okay, liner. So another complaint that I had when I was doing makeovers for these brands was everybody wanted to buy a liquid eyeliner, but when they got home to use it, because of the crepiness of the eyelid, they were, it was very uneven. It was mm -hmm. very uh, uh, spotted. So they didn't want to use it. So instead, going back to a good old pencil, and I'm going to show you on my uh, wrist here. Here's the pencil. If you just leave it like that and you rub it, it disappears probably within an hour or two. But if you apply the pencil and then take an angled brush and dip it into the same color of shadow, the, cream, the pencil is cream, the powder is powder. So when you go over that line, the cream absorbs the powder and it has staying power. Oh, so it won't and bleed. Look, and when I rub it, it doesn't come off. Very, very good. And your other choice, of course, is cake eyeliner. Yep. Again, from a brand that I love. And you have your little brush into the water. Make sure that it's not too wet because then it gets very, very runny. And when it's the right consistency, when you apply it, it's very, very easy and it's very easy to correct. So that's the biggest difficulty for me is if I make a mistake, correcting it. Yep, K Eyeliner will do it for you. All right, now another issue that I certainly struggle with, and I think many Zoomers may, is the stain powder of foundation. The stain powder, frankly, of any makeup, but particularly foundation. You find that you apply it in the morning, it looks great, fresh-faced, okay. and then by the end of the day, it's almost fallen off of your face. So we have two things for that. I have them over here. And the first thing is primer. So depending on what kind of skin you have, if you're dry, there's illuminating primer. If you are oily, there's mattifying primer. You put that on your face first, put your foundation on, let it set for a little bit. Once you have all your makeup on, you take a spray. What kind of spray? I am using the All Nighter um, by a brand that I love available at Chopper's Drug Mart and it's even called All Nighter. But what is it? It is, it sets, it's almost like putting a wrap over your makeup so that nothing gets at it. So the way to use it, I'm going to take off my glasses and you just, in an X one way, an X the other way, and you have to keep your eyes actually closed for about a minute for it to set mm -hmm. and then go on your merry way. And how effective is it? I mean, do you use um, this every day? I find it lasts. I don't want to use it every day. I use it when it's when you important, need to. when I need to. Um, okay, and the last is a little bit of a trick to make your face lift. Okay. Almost like a, a fake facelift, if you okay, will. This one I love, and I've done it on um, makeovers, is to go to a powder that is lighter than your actual foundation. You need to use a wedgie, and you go into the wedgie, into the powder with the wedgie on the corner, just like that. And I'm gonna do it on myself. You take the shape of your eye, and you literally go underneath, and you pull up with it just in the corner. And what it does, anything that's fallen down 
will disappear and you have the beautiful angle going up, the lift, so to speak. Again, I'm taking the wedgie with a little bit of the powder into the corner of the eye and you pull it up. As we wear our makeup, everything in the corner falls and um, perspiration, whatever, and you just lift up and everything is going up. Just lifts your face up Just a little lifts bit. everything up, cleans it up for you. That's it. All right, Genya, thank you for your time. That's awesome. When we come back, we'll hear final thoughts from our panelists. Welcome back with only a few minutes left. Panelists, will you leave us with some of your final thoughts? We'll start with Genya. First of all, don't be scared of makeup. And there are three things that every woman needs, and that's eyebrows, mascara, and lips. Okay, Sherry, leave us with your final thought. Well, I think so many of us are at home right now and there are hacks everywhere in our house. Places we don't expect from our moms that may be in their 70s and even our 13 year old kids. So keep looking. Melissa. Here's what I think about hacks. I love them and they work well when they work. But if you find they don't work, there's a plethora of other options you can use in your pantry. Start simple and then work your way up to the more complex cleaning products or tools to get the job done. Start easy and level up only if you have to. Jennifer. My final thought is you don't need a lot of fancy materials or fancy things to, to get crafty. So I would start by using what you have to get creative and then visit some online tutorials and see on how you can build on that process because there's nothing that feels better than making it yourself. And Kelly. Marissa, final thought is make technology your friend. We all have our smartphones or a computer or a tablet. Go into your online calendar and start to just plug in what you're going to do every week, every month, what have you, and make a commitment. Maybe not for today, but for some time in the future that you're going to handle automating those savings, protecting yourself from fraud, or starting that all-important estate planning binder. All right, that's all the time we have. Thank you to my panelists for being here and for you at home watching. We'll see you soon. For now, it's time to zoom out.